All right, good evening everybody. we got about a minute before the Bible study starts. So I'm going to go ahead and like and share it and uh, all that good stuff. I pray that everyone's having a good day. Uh, man, I had a great day. I had a great day. I got to spend some time uh, with some, some people I don't usually get to spend time with and enjoy their company and minister and now i got to do all kinds of stuff that i'm just excited about so i pray that y'all are having a good day hey tree hey cassidy i think i've already done that but i'll do it again hey brian all right it's seven o'clock let's open up with a word of prayer Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to come together and to study your holy word, Lord. Lord, I pray that we are curious about God's word. I pray that as we hear it and as we receive it and as we, we dissect it, Lord, that we have questions, that we have a desire to, to delve deeper, Lord, that, that we don't just take it at face value and, and, and move on, Lord. Let us, let us truly want to get to know you through the scripture that you have left for us, Lord. Allow us to, to know your word and allow us to see the, the correlation between the Old Testament and the New Testament. How the Old Testament affects us in our daily lives, Lord. And how the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ and, and the atoning sacrifice that he made on our behalf, Lord. Lord, please allow us to, to see the grace and the mercy that we have been afforded and, and to see the, the true nature of you, Lord. Let us see your nature. Let us see your essence, Lord. And let us see the love that you have for your people, Lord. Lord, we pray that you be with all those who are afflicted today. We pray that you be with those that are in need. We pray that you be with the lost. We pray that you be with the sick, Lord. We pray that you be with those that do not know you. And Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit works on their hearts and brings you brings them into salvation where you can do your work upon them, Lord. Lord, we pray that those that are new to your kingdom find their place, find their purpose, and desire to fulfill those purposes, Lord. Let us step into your grace. Let us step into your mercy. Let us not rest and become stagnant. Let us be moving forward. Let us, let us, let us put the work in so that we may be successful in the things that you have put before us, Lord. Let us enjoy this time together. Let us, let us see this scripture, Lord, and let us, let us realize how important it is, not just then, but now, in Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. All right, guys. So uh, we are in the book of Leviticus. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Leviticus for a few more weeks. Uh, about four more weeks. So uh, let's see. Today's the 21st. So right about you know mid-November, we will be moving into... Uh, Moving into a new book, uh, Numbers, but we are in Leviticus right now. Now, this is an interesting chapter. Um, remember what we've what we've been learning and what we've been going over. And I mean, it may sound like a repeat, uh, a broken record, but, you know, sometimes we need to hear the same things over and over again so that we can get what it is that God is trying to tell us. And uh, God is giving specific instructions to be carried out in a specific way. God is stressing the point of holiness. And really, that's what this chapter rolls into. The holiness of God and the holiness of man. And, you know, if we are with God and if that is who we are yoked to, we are to be holy. We are to be set apart. And uh, we've seen how, uh, how the people are set apart, how the, the priests are set apart. We've seen the sacrifices that are, are to be pleasing to the Lord. And we've seen all of these things come together in God's Word. Now, part of the problem that we run into is we're like, you know what? Jesus took care of all these things. I'm sorry, this chair is sinking on me. I would have been like three foot tall by the end of this. But um, part of the problem is, is we read the Old Testament, we're like, well, this isn't important because, because Jesus took this away from me. Or Jesus, uh, Jesus fulfilled this. And Jesus did fulfill the law. But, uh, you know, from the feasts and the sacrifices and everything else, I, I think that what we've seen is we, we see that there are definite parallels between then and now. Uh, the message of God has not changed. The love that he has for his people has not changed. And there is definitely, definitely something that we can take from all Scripture. Now, today is... Uh, I apologize. 
Today, uh, we are going to be in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, chapter 23 is a great chapter. Uh, we actually went over this chapter with uh, Pastor Tom from the Vineyard. Because uh, it speaks of all the festivals, and, and all of these festivals tie to Jesus Christ. Now, I loved when Pastor Tom came because he gave us the background on these on these festivals and these feasts. Um, now, what I want to do is uh, is I want to go a little bit further into these feasts, and I want to look at how these feasts tie into Jesus Christ. Because throughout this entire time, we can see something that ties us to Jesus Christ in each and every one of these feasts. Um, so we're going to take them one by one. We're going to break them down. We're going to read them, and then hopefully... Hopefully, we'll have some questions as we get into it. So, in verse twenty, uh, chapter 23, starting with verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses. So, again, we see that this is directly from the Lord. So, it's going from the Lord to Moses to the people. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They, they are my appointed feasts. So these are holy gatherings. That's what a convocation is. It's a, it's a gathering, a celebration. These are holy gatherings, holy celebrations. And the first one is the Sabbath. The Sabbath is to be held every single week. Now, um, you know, there is arguments and there is pushback on what day the Sabbath is. Um, you know, is it Saturday? Is it Sunday? Is it Wednesday? Is it, it as I've stated before, the Sabbath for the Israelites would have fallen on a Saturday. The first church, for whatever reason, the early church decided to change it to Sunday. There's, there's actually lots of reasons. But what we need to take into uh, account is the meaning behind the Sabbath. In verse 3 it says, Six days work shall be done. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall not do new work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So it's not just a day of rest, okay? A day of rest is me taking a Tuesday off and going and playing golf and then coming home and taking a nap and relaxing. That's a day of rest. That That's... It's it's good and it's fine and it does recharge me and, and you know uh, the Lord knows how I'm built the Lord knows that I need those days but what makes the Sabbath the Sabbath is the words solemn rest a holy convocation so the Sabbath is a time to gather and to celebrate and to glorify the Lord. So whatever, whatever day, you know, you are marking as the Sabbath, you should be celebrating the Lord that day. It's not just a you day. We get plenty of you days. It should be a he day for every single week. And when we go, remember that we want this to be pleasing to the Lord. So what, the Sabbath is a day that we go and we celebrate the Lord. How can you celebrate if you do something begrudgingly, if you don't want to be at church, if you don't want to worship properly, if you don't want to take part in praise and worship, if you don't want to, to celebrate what the Lord has done for you, and you don't want to glorify the Lord, there's really no point in being there. I know that that's unfortunate to hear me say, but that is a day of holy convocation. It's a day of holy gathering. It's a day in which we are set apart from the world. There are a lot of people that take Sunday off. But we, as God's people, we take Sunday off a little differently. We go and we praise the Lord. We go and we worship. We go and we share scripture. We go and we greet each other with hugs. We come into God's house with God's people. And we, we gather and we are holy together. We are set apart from the things of that world during that time. It's a, it's, it's a time in which we can come and we can pour out to the Lord. It's a time in which we can, we can be with the Lord. So that's how we need to approach our Sabbath. That's how we need to approach 
our, 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 our day with the Lord. When we walk through the doors of the church, it needs to be an intentional time of worship. We need to come with the purpose of being holy. Being holy looks so many different kinds of ways. Being holy can look like a celebration, like clapping your hands. Being holy can be in prayer. Being holy can be in receiving scripture. Being holy can be in a state of repentance. But whenever you come through those doors, you need to decide what it is that you are going to be that is pleasing to the Lord. Because all of those things are pleasing to the Lord. Celebrating the Lord, pleasing. State of repentance, pleasing. Receiving God's word, pleasing. So whatever it is that you are doing on that Sabbath, it should be pleasing to the Lord. And why is it a holy convocation? He wants his people together because we grow from each other. We glean wisdom from each other. We glean knowledge from each other. We, 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 we grow together. We support each other in God. We help each other in God. We do these things, not for us, but we do these things because we are, can have, have the ability to enrich the kingdom. God created us. So that we may be able to do work here on earth for him. This is a time of, 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 of thankfulness. This is a time of, of, of repentance. This is a time of celebration. And we've got to look at, I mean, with standing up from the pulpit, I should not open my eyes and see. I know that I am not the most exciting speaker in the world. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shocked by that. But it's not me that you're there for. You are receiving praise and worship that is directed by the Lord. You are receiving a message that is directed by the Lord. If there are times that you feel like the sermon is speaking directly to you, praise God because that's God saying something to you. It's not because I'm picking on you. So know and understand that this is a time to be in union with the Lord and to be in union with God's people, a holy convocation that we are supposed to do each and every week. Then we get into the Passover. Now the Passover is a feast that celebrates when, the, the, when death passed over the people of Israel. And they were freed from Egypt. They were freed from the slaughter that was that was that they deserved. Remember that not just Egypt deserved what happened. Actually, each and every one of us deserved what happened. And it it, it, it is a a if you read that story as 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 the 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 spirit passes through and takes the first male of every household. You see the power of the Lord and you see what the ability, the ability that he, he has, what he could do to us, and actually what he should do to us if we raised out and we looked at our sin. So it says in verse 4, it says, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, again, we see specific instructions given to the people of Israel at twilight. So not even, not even just day and month, but time. It says it's the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread before the Lord. So I want to go over the Passover first. So the Passover, how does that relate to Jesus Christ? Well, we have to look and we have to think about what was done. Israel was spared and set free from the enslavement of Egypt. It was very symbolic. They put blood on the doorposts and the Holy Spirit knew who to pass over. 
we can look at the parallels there and we can see that this definitely is a gift from God, which is a gift from Christ, which we are also passed over. And don't get what we deserve because of the justification that we receive from the blood of Jesus Christ. So even though we are not Israelites and even though we do not celebrate the Passover per se, we can still glean from that that the blood of Christ, just like the blood of the unblemished lamb, passed allows the Holy Spirit to pass over us so that we can be justified. We are not justified without the blood of Jesus Christ. We have to be fully cognizant of what he has done for us. Should we celebrate that? Absolutely. We should have a feast every single day for that. Now, the, the unleavened bread. This is, this is a, a, a feast that begins the day following the start of uh, Passover. Now, unleavened bread. Think about what the leaven does. Um, Jesus talks about the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, you know, we see unleavened bread throughout scripture. This is, leaven would be mixed in and it would cause the bread to rise. It would cause the bread to be different. It would cause the bread to be tainted, actually. I mean, it still tastes good. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, so God wanted bread free of leaven. When we accept Jesus Christ, when we accept the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us and allows us to be justified, and we become set apart, we should make every attempt to be like Jesus Christ, who was not tainted by the sin of the world. Jesus Christ is that unleavened bread. We should strive to remove ourselves from the world as much as possible. Now, I'm not saying go out into the middle of the woods and build a lean-to and, 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 and grow a beard, you know, down to here and, uh, you know, uh, become a crotchety person that separates yourself from all civilization. That's not it at all. But the ways of the world, we need to, to, to strive to separate from. Will we ever do it completely? No. We are already tainted. We are already tainted with the world. But Jesus was not. So now we have that, that symbol. We have that, 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 that fully man, fully God, man God, untainted by sin. And, you know, we, we take and we make all kinds of heroes. We make heroes out of people in Hollywood. We make heroes out of people in sports. We make heroes out of, out of mentors in our lives. We make heroes out of, out, of, out of people, flawed people, people that are just messed up. When the, the true hero is directly in front of us in the person of Jesus Christ. The untouched by sin, untainted image of Jesus Christ should be burned and ingrained in our head. And we should definitely receive that message that is being delivered here. God, God the reason that he didn't want them to, to eat leavened bread, and I'm going to read on from 7 to the end of this little part here real quick. It says, On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. So on the first and the seventh day is a holy gathering, a time of, of set-apartness for the people of Israel. They're set apart. And the, the bread is not tainted by the world. And that's what God is really wanting for his people. Because the less tainted we are by the world, the more peace we will have in our lives. The more joy that we will have in our lives. God is not removing us from the world to harm us. God is removing us from the world because he knows that it is the world that is killing us. I've said it a thousand times. God has never taken anything 
out of our lives that is harmful to us. So understand what God is doing. And then the feast of the first fruits, starting with verse 9. And it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And we shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. Hold that in your mind right there. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the, 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 the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord, with a pleasing aroma, and a drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen. You shall eat either bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So no matter where they go, no matter what generation they're in, they are to celebrate this. They are to celebrate the feast of the first fruits. Now, Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. The first fruits of the dead. And he is the, the, the harvester. He is the one that harvests the souls. And we will go after him. But he is the first fruits. He is the first of the resurrection. So we will, we will follow him. He is the first fruits. When we read about this feast, we can definitely see a parallel to Jesus Christ. And we can definitely see what was done on our behalf. And what's so amazing is each and every one of these feasts, and if you notice... Hold a meaning that is tied to Jesus Christ. What we are doing is we are watching and we are seeing what Jesus did and how Jesus Christ lived through these feasts. Because of him, we have been passed over and we are justified because of his blood. He was untouched by sin and wants us to be set apart and be like that. He wants us to be like him. And... And he has shown us the way. Because without the resurrection, we would have nothing. We would have nothing. And then comes the Feast of Weeks. And it says, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So this is this is direct countdown. And it says, You shall count fifty days to the day of the seventh Sabbath. And then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. Notice that he doesn't want that old stanky grain. He wants the new grain. He wants the first part of the grain. We, we need to be so cognizant of what we give the Lord. Is what we are giving Lord, is what we are putting into the kingdom, is it the first fruits or is it our leftovers? Be mindful of that because you know and God knows. I don't know. But you know and God knows. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two-tenths of an ephah. So again, specific instruction to be carried out in specific ways. And, and, and this is the second, second feast, uh, the second of, the, of, of three harvest feasts. So this is, this is a harvest time. And it says, they shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. As first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd, and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, 
with their grain offering and their drink offerings and a food offering with a pleasing aroma for a sin offering. So we are, we are offering something that is pleasing to the Lord. We are offering a wave offering. We are offering a peace offering. And then we are offering uh, a, a sin offering for our sins. And two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits before the Lord with the two lambs. And they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. Again, we see holy convocation. We see that this harvest is met with a holy convocation. We see that it is coming together. And then we, it says that you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generation. And then verse 22, it goes in and it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. God is saying, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to glean to the edge. And you don't have to take, uh, you don't have to gather what is left over. You don't have to, to, to uh, pick up what's on the ground. You have plenty. And God gives you plenty. Now, the thing that's so great about this Feast of Weeks is this Feast of Weeks is also very important to the modern church. The modern church, the day in which the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples in Jerusalem was the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the Feast of Weeks. 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ that day through the movement of the Holy Spirit. We can read it in the book of Acts. It's not in Titus. There it is. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there dwelling Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking uh, Galileans? Now, and how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and, and Elamites and, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and, and Cappadocia, uh, Pontius and, and, and Asia, Phygera and, and Pal uh, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome of Jews and, 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 and proselytes, uh, Cretans and Arabians were we hear them telling in our own languages the mighty works of God, and they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. So we see the Holy Spirit come upon them on the day of Pentecost, and we see that this is when the church is born, and 3,000 souls come to know Jesus Christ that day. And we also see something that's very important is we see the movement of the Spirit. We see that the Spirit is completely obvious in the book of Acts, right there. And we see that there are still people mocking, saying, oh, they're drunk. I don't know about you. Now, I've drank before. I know that's a shocker. But I have never gotten drunk and been able to speak French. I have never gotten drunk and been able to speak German 
I've never gotten drunk and been able to speak. Heck, I barely speak English. There is, drunkenness is not an explanation for them speaking native tongues from other, other areas and people understanding them. It was the movement of the Holy Spirit. So this is a day that marks the feast, the, the harvest of the Lord. Next is the Feast of Trumpets, and it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. So, God's people gather. The trumpet blast, and it starts the, the wedding feast celebration in which Jesus Christ returns. So we've seen the life of Jesus Christ. We've seen him be sinless. We see the death of Jesus Christ. We see the death of Jesus Christ in in the in the in the in the in the in the blood that, that atones for us in the Passover. We see uh, the the resurrection of Jesus Christ in these feasts. And now we are seeing the return of Jesus Christ. So we see life, we see death, we see resurrection, and now we see return. Are y'all getting what, I mean, this was written 1,500 years before Jesus Christ. This is not just arbitrary rules or arbitrary feasts. This is the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, being laid out 1,500 years before he was born. Because if we take the date of Exodus, and we look at the birth of Jesus Christ, and we take into account the 40 years that they dwell in the wilderness, it puts us right at 1,500 years. It's amazing. I mean, it, it, it mind-boggling. Blow your mind. And don't take my word for it. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to read the Scripture. I want you to correlate the scripture. Does this scripture apply to us? Absolutely. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there is no way that these feasts do not touch your life. There is no way that these feasts do not show you Jesus Christ. It's an impossibility if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ to not appreciate these Impossible. And then the Day of Atonement. And we've talked about this day. We've already talked about this in, in length, but we're going we're gonna to talk about it just a little bit more. Because, uh, because it's important. So in verse 26, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day, the seventh month, is the Day of Atonement. It should be for you a time of holy convocation. Again, gather, and you shall afflict yourself. You shall afflict yourself. You shall feel your sin. You shall pour your sin out. Your sin shall bring, it shall pour out of you. And present a food offering to the Lord. You should not do any work that very day. For it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever. Throughout your generations and all your dwelling places, it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict yourselves 
on the ninth day of the month, beginning of the evening, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. So God is giving very, very, very specific instructions. But you see, we don't have to have the Day of Atonement. Because in the Day of Atonement is the day that Jesus Christ died for you. But the real day of atonement is the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So now we've seen life, death, resurrection, return, and we see relationship. That relationship with Jesus Christ is what atones for your sin. People say, Jesus Christ died for everybody. Jesus Christ dying for everybody is one of the biggest lies that you will ever tell yourself. Jesus Christ died for those that would come to know him. Jesus Christ died for those that would accept him. There is no way that the demons in the New Testament are in heaven. Yet they knew who Jesus was. It cannot just be, I know who Jesus is in passing. It cannot be just, I know of this man, Jesus, or I believe in the historical Jesus, or I believe in parts of the Bible, or I believe in everything but the supernatural stuff in the Bible. I believe in, I can't, you can't believe in part of Jesus you, because you can't be partially saved. You can't be partially atoned for and expect to receive the grace and the mercy that comes with a true relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship is crucial. It's crucial. And if you don't have that relationship, the Day of Atonement is essential to you. That Day of Atonement needs to come as soon as possible. But we can't talk you into it. We can't, we can't, we can't will you into it. We can't, uh, we, can't, we can't speak fancy words and get you into it. We can't trick you into it. It is something that you have to do with your relationship with Jesus Christ. He has made himself available to you. And then finally, we have the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. Again, on the first day, the people, the people are coming together to celebrate this. And it says for it says, On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day, you should hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, drink offerings, on its proper day, besides the Lord's Sabbath, besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. God is saying, I want your intentional worship, what we talked about a little while ago. I want it to be intentional. I want this to be intentional. You have to be the participant. And it says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take the, the first day of fruit, splendid trees, branches of palm, and, and, and burrows of leafy trees, and willows on the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate as the feast of the Lord seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh day of the month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. 
that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feast of the Lord. When the Lord brought the people out of uh, Egypt, the Israelites, were, they were just living in booths. They were just living in tents. And uh, yet... They were protected by God's grace and by God's mercy. The weather didn't get them. The, the enemy didn't get them. Um, you know, uh, they, were, they were covered by God's grace. There was a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire day and night. And, and God was with them at all times. And they did not have to worry about all the things of the world coming down on them, all the things of the world harming them. They were protected while they were in the wilderness. Now, were they obedient? No, not all the time. Did they live a life... Uh, you know, perfect to God? Absolutely not. Did they ever have to suffer earthly consequences? Absolutely. Um, however, they were protected. And, and, and this, is, this is what we, we are going to close with as far as the feast, because that's the end of Leviticus 23. And it is the final piece that I want to put together for you right here. Now we've seen the life, we've seen the death, we've seen the resurrection. We have seen the atonement. We have seen the relationship. And now we see the reward. We see the reward that we are promised through relationship with Jesus Christ. The protection that he provides and the peace that comes with the knowledge that there will be a day that we are with Christ in heaven. We will be without worry. We will be without sadness. We will be filled with joy. And nothing will ever harm us. That protection is available to us through Jesus Christ. So, when we get people that say, Oh, the feasts of the Old Testament, they're not important to us. We're New Testament Christians. Well, they're, they're, they're Christians that are only receiving part of Jesus Christ. It is important that we look at these feasts, we look at the correlation between the feast and Jesus Christ, we look at the prophetic nature of these feasts, and we look at what Jesus Christ did through us. When these feast times come up, Look at each thing that Jesus Christ did for you. you. We don't celebrate as Israelites because we're not Israelites. But these are all directly tied to Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ we celebrate. These feasts are important. It's important that we know what these feasts mean. It's important that we know when these feasts are. It's our heritage as sons and daughters of a king to know. I can't stress it enough. And you know what? What's, what's sad is, you know, even though we say this, three quarters of the people won't even care. Three quarters of the people haven't even heard a word that we were talking about. They were doing something else. They were watching their television. They were... They were typing on Facebook, messaging, doing something. These things are important as far as our relationship with our Lord and Savior goes. So, at this time, do we have any questions, concerns, comments, or complaints? We don't have any questions, comments, concerns, or complaints. Let's close out with a word of prayer. Um, Cheesehead or Michael Humphreys, whichever one he's going about today, uh, he has asked for a uh, prayer for DJ Townsend. He had a 10-hour surgery yesterday to remove his uh, the hump from his back. We will definitely be in prayer. He's only 17 years old. So 
He's a young man who's struggling. Let's let's pray for him. Let's pray for him in earnest. Let's carry that into our prayer closets and, uh, and, and pray for him, not just here, but away from the Bible study as well. Let's continue to be in prayer for Gary and his healing. Let's continue to be in prayer for the church. Um, let's be in prayer for... Uh, for Nate, uh, as he leads worship, uh, and that we have a, a wonderful worship service on Sunday, uh, be in prayer for Nikki and, uh, and and all that she does and all that she brings, uh, not just to my household, but to uh, to the church and to each of our lives. Uh, let's be in prayer for Grammy TT and uh, and all that she does. I pray that you uh, be uh, in prayer for for Joey. Um, and all that he does, and uh, not just for his household, but for this ministry. Uh, Y'all may not realize it, but Joey works ministry every single day. He uh, he he is a huge part of, of the ministries that the Lord has put before us. Um, so let's be in prayer. Let's be in prayer for each other. Um, let's be in prayer for the unspoken prayer requests. Let's be in prayer for those that are in need, and let's be in prayer. For our, 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 our city, our country, um, let's be in prayer for, for our region. And um, as far as announcements go, um, community service Saturday starts at 9 a.m. at the church. We've got a lot of projects, so um, let's, let's have a good showing. You know? I mean, let's be people of service. Um, so let's have a good showing there. Sunday we have service at 11. Um, uh, Brian Moser is going to be baptized, so uh, let's, let's, let's be there. Praise God for that. Um, next week, uh, the adult education will not meet, but the following week they will be back. So, um, you know, take, you, take yourself a week. Rest, get prepared, and then uh, if you if you want to do the adult education, uh, it's available to you. And uh, other than that, I can't think of any announcements. Um, oh, I thought of one more. Uh, the fourth Sunday of this month, we which is next Sunday, um, we will be doing a uh, a meal over at uh, East Main Christian Church. <laughs> also known as loaves and fishes. And uh, let's close out with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this day. We thank you again for this opportunity to come together and to celebrate you, Lord. Lord, let us see the importance of your word from beginning to end. Lord, let us understand that your son, Jesus Christ, was not a, 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 a hidden secret, Lord. His coming was essential for your people, Lord. Without him, we would not have freedom. Without him, we would not have salvation. Without him, we would not be atoned for. And without him, we would not have any hope for the future, Lord. Lord, let us glorify him each and every day. And Lord, I pray that you be with the prayer requests that we sent up specifically, Lord. Lord, hear those prayers. Do with them as you will, Lord, and allow us to bask in your glory. Lord, I pray that you bless each and every individual listening now, each and every person that may listen later, Lord. I pray that you give them peace. I pray that you give them understanding, Lord. And I pray that we grow to appreciate your holy word the way that we should. Be with us as we finish out our weeks. And let us come together and celebrate the Sabbath together, Lord, intentionally. Let's have an intentional purpose when we come and celebrate you. Lord, let us not be distracted by the things of this world. Let us remain to be set apart as holy, understanding that the sinless life of your Son, Jesus Christ, is our example. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Can I get an air mirror? Just need an amen. Well, while we're waiting on the amen, I just want y'all to know that I love y'all and I appreciate y'all. And I pray that y'all have a wonderful week. And uh, I'm so excited about Sunday. I'm so excited to see y'all. I'm so excited to, to, to be able to preach on Sunday. And uh, 
I just pray that we continue to grow the way that we are. I mean, we have uh, we have seen some amazing things happen in this little church, and uh, it's all because of God. It's all because of God, and it's all so amazing. So may he receive the glory, and may y'all have a wonderful week. God bless. I don't know if we got an amen or not, but I think that we're there.